This is the same outline we had last week, uh, continued. So if you go to uh, Daniel chapter 8, Daniel chapter 8. All right, we are in the 8th chapter of Daniel. I've titled the message, God's Dominion in Chastening. God's Dominion in Chastening. And you'll see that, why I use that as a, a title of this section uh, as we get um, into, oh, I think it's verse 12 or so, but we will we'll dig into that in just a moment. Um, you know, unfortunately, chapter 8, you know, as, as already mentioned, God is very sovereign. These things aren't just happenstance. We also see that there is bad news in store for Israel. A time of heavy, dark persecution by, a, frankly, a wicked government. As we're going to see the prophecies concerning Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, the little horn, that not the little horn of Revelation, but the little horn of Daniel 8, being that of Antiochus Epiphanes, who comes out of that great horn, if you were, the, uh, Alexander the Great, one of the four generals, and uh, that divides up the kingdom. Antiochus, just to be straight, uh, clear though, Antiochus Epiphanes is not one of Alexander's generals, but one who was part of the Seleucus kingdom that was one of the four generals of Seleucus. So um, that gets us into about 171, 175 when Antiochus comes on the scene in this passage. And we're going we're gonna to go over some of the things that he did during that time again. But I want to dive into our text. Look in chapter 8, beginning in verse 8. And we will go through verse 19 and then uh, jump over to verse 25. Therefore, the male goat grew very great. But when he became strong, the, the large horn was broken. And in place of it, four notable ones came up toward the four winds of heaven. And out of one of them came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, toward the glorious land. And it grew up to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. And he even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifices were taken away. And the place of the, his sanctuary was cast down because of transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices. And he cast truth down to the ground. He did all this and prospered. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to the certain one who was speaking, How long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices of the transgression of desolation and the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to trample it underfoot? And he said to me, For two thousand three hundred days or evening mornings till the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Then it happened when I, Daniel, had seen the vision and was seeking the meaning that suddenly there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli, at which, who called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood. And where he came, I was afraid and fell on my face. But he said to me, understand, son of man, that the vision refers or pertains to the time of the end. Now, as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep with my face to the ground. But he touched me and stood me upright. And he said, look, I am making known to you what shall happen in the latter time of the indignation. For the appointed time, the end shall be. The ram which you saw having the two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. And the male goat is of the kingdom of Greece. And I actually read farther. Let's skip over to verse 25. Though his cunning, he shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule. And he shall exalt himself in his heart, and he shall destroy many in their prosperity, and shall even rise against the prince of princes, 
and he shall be broken without human means. Let's pray. Father, would you please help us to be living in light of your sovereignty? Lord, we struggle when bad things happen. Lord, and, and that word bad is so subjective in our estimation of things. Lord, we call things bad that you may call chastening. Yet there's the morality of it is holy. Lord, please help us to have a straight view of really what's happening in this world. Lord, sinful men inflict wicked things and, and pain and hurt upon others. They are guilty of sin, yet holy accomplishments may even come, even judgment. Lord, help us to remember that judgment is justice. And help us, Lord, to remember when is it wrong for a just God to do just things? And we know the answer is it's never wrong. Lord, we are here by your grace and your mercy. And we love you and we want to thank you for your kindness and your forbearance with sinners like us. We love you, Lord. In Jesus we pray. Amen. So in our passage here, I, I, same proposition as I had last week. I asked the question, when things get bad, what do we need to be thinking? Well, the first challenge is God wants us to trust him as faithful in his care and to his word. Faithful. That is, we always see God as faithful. We see him sovereign through all these things. Last time we saw that our God is sovereign over the remote details of the future. So we only handled one point last week, and that being uh, that simple point there. Verse 9, we see the little horn here is Antiochus Epiphanes. Verse 10, he attacks the glorious land of Israel. That, the beautiful land, you might have the translation there. Israel, the, the promised land. Verse 11 claims uh, the Antiochus, he, he brags that he's God. On his own coins, he bragged that he was God. And so here we see this pompous individual. And not only that, we see he uh, takes away the evening and morning sacrifices. We often struggle, but God, why do the wicked prosper? Isn't that been a question asked for thousands of years by believers? Lord, why are the wicked prospering? Why is it that I have it so hard? We have this temptation to view things in such a way that, um, that, that skews things. You know, why do the wicked prosper? The question we need to ask in some of this is, how can you use... Uh, this is not the right question. This is how our thinking goes. How can you, God, use the ungodly to punish the people of God? Why, why is it that we do that? I was trying to think over it. You know, in our UN charters and our laws of the land, international law, culturally, we tend to see the aggressor nation as the bad guy. That's logical. And the other nations really shouldn't be violating other nations' freedom. I mean, we get that. The real issue is, though, this, I think. Can a holy, sovereign God allow an aggressor nation to do what they would naturally do and hold them accountable for it? The answer is yes. God can let... God is so sovereign, He can use sinful, aggressive, evil men thugs, if you would, to do what they naturally would do and still he is able to carry out some of the things. Now, I want to be careful here. Some of you are thinking, but pastor, that crime was evil, that was ugly. God has stated his moral will. Sin is never in his moral will. His permissive will, it may be permitted. His effectual will, certain things are predetermined. And we know that he's able to work all things together for good. And you're like, Pastor, that just got a little more complicated. Why did it get complicated? Because we don't like some of the results. We don't like some of the... But here's one of the, the problems. We also need to... Who do we pin sin on, guys? Man, not God. The problem we have a lot of times is 
God, why did you cause this to happen? God's like, I permitted sinful people who love sin to do their freedom of sinning. And I'm going to hold them accountable to it. But you know what, what we like? Okay, guys, I hate to say it. We like vengeance. We, God, why don't you zap them now? Take care of these guys. God's like, no. Until the, their transgression is to the full. No, it's not done yet. It's still being filled. And so I think those are some of the things we have to think and process through some of that with. Today, I want us to consider this. Our God is sovereign over, number two, chasing us when we are wayward. He is sovereign over chasing us when we're wayward. So we saw last week how that the, the goat, um, if you would, with one horn, displaces Medo-Persia. Um, the, the, un, the, the ram had two horns, smaller, that became larger than the other, an unequal alliance. And uh, we've gone through the kingdoms already. But let's go into this. Two, uh, our God is sovereign over chastening us when we are wayward. Verses 12 through 14, and then verse 17, 19, and 23. Now in verse 12, look there, uh, if you would, in your Bibles, because of transgression, an army, or you could translate that, a host, ESV, I believe has there, um, King James, ESV, and NASB, I think they all have host. Um, was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices. And he cast truth down to the ground. And he did all this and prospered. Oh, don't we struggle with that last part? The prosperity of the wicked? Antiochus? How could this be? Well, this, as we look into this, one of the things we need to start out with, verse 12, because of transgression... Now, good men have disagreed. Whose transgression is the Antiochus's? You could argue that. It would be easy to argue that. Um, um, and the ESV renders it an act of rebellion, as in like the transgression of Antiochus. Um, I side with uh, because of transgression or the account of transgression. I believe it's the Jews. And I believe that an army is the host of the Jews. It's the Jewish people. And I think that's going to be spelled out a little more in verse 13. But as we walk through, let's read verse 13 as well. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to the certain one who was speaking, How long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? So the latter transgression is that of Antiochus when he violates the temple and the sacrifices. In verse 12, it's the same continuous uh, oppression of the people, the Jewish people, but it starts out with verse 12 because of transgression, on account of transgression. And that, I, I believe, is that of the host that Israel has committed. That's my view. You can, you can check it out. Um, the Jews are given over to opposition of this little horn who's opposing daily sacrifices. Well, in verse 8, do you remember that, that great horn? That was Alexander the Great. Um, he had great power. Then we have the little horn that comes out from his kingdom, Seleucus' kingdom. And that little horn grew exceedingly great, verse 9. Well, in history, we see that this ends up being, the fulfillment is Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus, his name means this, David Jeremiah said, Antiochus, God made manifest. Or Antiochus, the great one of God. Um, guy was quite humble, as you've noticed. And... Uh, that's uh, what we find all over history as not only the meaning of his name, but on coinage and various things he's done. He persecuted the Jews heavily. Horrible persecutions. In Egypt, when he was on his way to conquer the world, he stopped by, um, he ended up getting stopped by Rome. Rome had some armies that he ran into. Um, I, if I understand things correct, in Egypt, 
in his, all of his fury and frustration, Antiochus turned his forces away from Egypt and marched up the maritime Mediterranean right along the sea. And then he went right into Jerusalem. And when he did that, he vented his anger by taking to the Jerusalem and sacked the city. He killed in that encounter 80,000 Jewish people. He took 40,000 and made them slaves at that time. He took the high priest and he auctioned him off to be sold as a slave and then sold the position of the highest uh, high priest to the highest bidder. And so just the guy, it gets worse. He plundered the temple. He took the golden altar of incense he, that stood before the inner veil. And then he, took, he tried to totally eradicate the Jewish religion out of Israel and replace it with Greek and pagan belief systems. So much so that Antiochus Epiphanes, instead of allowing them to worship and hold the celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles, he had them celebrate the Feast of Bacchanalia. Uh, you've probably heard of the god Bacchus, which was the god of wine and uh, pleasures and he was he forced the jews to observe saturnalia the worship of saturn he used he brought harlots into the temple and made that mandatory mandatory in his in the worship during that time he then forbid the reading of scriptures he made a book burning if you would and started burning every scroll of the torah that he could find he burned those, and then any Jewish practice was for strictly forbidden upon penalty of death. So much so, it's been reported that women who had circumcised their son, he made it, you can no longer do that. And what was one of the signs of being a faithful Jew? The church age, water baptism is a, is a symbol that we're identified with Christ. Israel, what was their symbol? You're circumcised, you, you observe the Sabbath day and you keep it holy. Those were markers, identifiers that you follow the Lord God. Well, he then made it illegal to do that. It was reported of a woman, that, uh, two women that sat, that, um, who did circumcise their boys, and baby boys, and he had the babies hung and uh, just horribly, brutally killed. It's a worse story. That I'm not telling you the story. It's just gross. Um, not only that, he... There was a woman who had seven sons, and uh, they, they wanted to obey the Lord and do things right. She had, he had them, he cut their tongues out, and he fried them alive on iron plans. The guy was just sick, wicked, wicked sick. And as we, uh, we happily leave this nasty uh, illustration of what he did, um, he, he did all kinds of things to their holy days and substituted them with his own wicked um, holidays. Verse 13, let's move on to Daniel. Then I heard a holy one speaking and another, notice that's an italicized, and holy one said to that one certain who was speaking, how long will the vision be? concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host be trampled underfoot. I heard, you can hear Daniel, he's hearing these horrible things. The, we get the temple back and it's going to, they're going to desecrate the things that are holy unto the Lord. And you can hear the heart of, I, I heard, and by the end of this, verse 27, Dan, and I, Daniel, fainted and was sick for days afterwards. I arose and went about the king's business. Christian, do you get sick when things are wicked in our land? When they light up the Empire State Building and they celebrate full-term abortions, when the governor of Virginia celebrates abortion, does it grieve your righteous soul? Or would we become too much a part of Sodom and Gomorrah that it doesn't hurt anymore? Daniel was grieved, sick to his stomach. I fainted within me. It, literally, the Hebrew is, sleep failed from me. I mean, it's just, he is just so grieved by this thing, and he doesn't even understand it, but he knows it's bad. 
He is feeling the tensions of the heavenly beings, holy ones, saying, How long, how long will this go on? That men will desecrate things that are holy unto the Lord. Because you know one thing angels know as they cry out one to another, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. They know one thing, God is totally other, separate, Kadesh. He is pure. And no sin should be in His presence. And these holy ones, you can imagine even the angels along with Daniel are feeling the weight of the wickedness of man. What does it tell us? It tells us the forbearance of God to put up with really stubborn, obnoxious people. What a God we serve. Yet those who love Him say, Oh, he's worthy of so much more. How easy, though, do we get complacent about our sins and say, it's, he'll forgive me. You know, I often in counseling, pastor, but, but God will forgive me. I said, what about God? Does it please God? But he'll forgive me. He'll forgive you, but you're grieving Him. You may grieve His Holy Spirit, and you'll become farther and farther away. You know, too much of the time, we want the escapes of pleasure, the seasons of sin. We're looking for thrills in the wrong places. And meanwhile, we're hurting the most important of all relationships, the Almighty God that we know. Well, as we look on this, I heard... A holy one speaking, verse 13. Two beings are called holy ones, and they cry out, How long? How much time is going to elapse in the fulfillment of the destruction symbolized in this vision? Basically is what they ask. The word for brings desolation. In Hebrew is a participle, depicting Antiochus' transgression, uh, transgressing activities in progress. Um, and I quote that from Leon Wood. And it then goes on the scripture, verse 13, that the sanctuary and host will be trampled. Um, here we have the temple, the host, the Jewish people. They're trampled. And this word trampled, it, it fits exactly with Antiochus Epiphanes. He, he did enormous havoc upon the temple of God and the worship of God. You know, when scripture speaks of the desecration of the temple... Antiochus Epiphanes also took a, a sow, brought it into the temple, drained, bled the, the hog out, took its blood, boiled the thing on the altar in, in the temple, and then splattered unclean, defiling things that no Jew would want to touch. And, and splashed it all over the, the inside, all over the curtains, all over the holy things, all over the instruments dedicated unto the Lord. Things that said holiness unto the Lord were splattered in complete defiance of the Lord. You know, I've asked you before, how come we don't go around saying, O oh, Buddha? Because that name's not holy, truly. But the world will fight against God will, will mock it, will abbreviate it, will use it as an explicit, explicit. We will use slang and various other means to derogate, in, in a derogatory nature, speak of him. Why? Because it's in defiance of him. It's sin. We're tempted to sin. We're not tempted to say, oh Buddha, oh Confucius, oh Hindu. We, we don't do that. It's just not a temptation. You never hear it. And yet, we come here and what do we see Antiochus doing? He splatters the things that are dedicated to God with a thing that is directly in opposition to him. You couldn't be more obnoxious. And he sprays this all over, the sow's blood all over everything. Verse 14, then we see something that takes place. How long is this going to go on? 
And he said to me, for 2,300 days. Now, you notice the New King James has a little asterisk there. Literally, the Hebrew word is evening mornings. So for 2,300 evening mornings, and I think the NASB renders it that way, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. And so as you come into this passage, you see this uh, report and that for basically 1,150 days and a total of, or 2,300 evening mornings, the sacrifices will be removed in the regular worship of the Lord God. Now, in this uh, section, we, we go on over to verse 17. Would you please, in verse 17? So he came near when, where I stood. And when he came, I was afraid and fell on my face. But he said to me, understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. We see the next point here is that um, one thing, the observation, I should say, with Daniel, he's terrified. This is a normal human reaction when coming in the presence of one of God's supernatural beings. And we see the angels. This is not untypical of the book of Judges in chapter 6 or Job 42 before God or Isaiah 6 before God and the angels. And uh, you sense a, a personal sinfulness in understanding who you are. Woe is me, as Isaiah said. Now, Daniel's reaction before Gabriel as he fell onto his face it seems like it's showing his unworthiness. Understand, O son of man, Gabriel's response is assuring. He's like, you, you, this is where this is going, Daniel. You are to stay on task with the meaning of this. This is all going to occur at the time of the end. It shows basically that um, things, that this is coming. We see then his response is, I fainted. Um, often that's used of uh, a falling into a deep sleep, but here it would literally be a fainting. That, that is the, a, the best rendering of that. And Daniel experienced um, all kinds of emotional uh, tug throughout this whole thing as well as mental and trying to figure things out. And uh, verse, you get into verse 18, upon my face to the ground, he's already in a fallen position. He, he touched me. Gabriel came close enough to Daniel so that he needed only to stoop to touch the prostrated form of Daniel. And uh, he caused Daniel to stand uprightly, to stand, um, to stand up by him. And uh, we see him restored. Another thing is, this all goes to the appointed time of the end. And which is a good reminder to us, everything has an appointed time. You know, I remind people often, when folks die, so much of the time, but if only I had been there. I've done that before. If only I'd been there, I would have been able to help more. Maybe could have saved their life. Maybe could have done this. Maybe could have done that. Do we really believe that man's days are numbered? Do we really believe the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord? Do we really believe that heaven is better than this? Do we really believe that precious inside of the Lord is the death of the saints? Those are all questions that we have to grapple with all the time, I believe. Because... It's too easy to see what around us is good when it's marred by sin. The day is coming when we'll see Him as He is. And we say, oh, Maranatha, our Lord, come quickly. But uh, with um, verse 19, oh, I did have verse 19. Uh, look there for a moment, verse 19. And He said, look, I am making known to you what shall happen in the latter time or the latter portion of the indignation for the appointed time the end shall be. So here the indignation is the period of history where, uh, during which God in it is indignant or angry with Israel because of its rebellion against him. It is the time when God chastens Israel usually at the hands of the Gentiles. And uh, this kind of description is some of what we've seen elsewhere. Now, verse 23 and in the latter time of their kingdom, 
when the transgressors have reached their fullness. Again, isn't that interesting? That is, it, it's limited. When it, literally, you could translate it, when they've reached their limit or their full measure. When they've reached the full point, if you would, where God cannot permit them to go any further. A king shall arise having fierce features. That is, he's bold, he's insolent. Having fierce features. Fierce features, that is bold, insolent, who understands sinister schemes. The guy's crafty. And uh, we, we see that being a great description of Antiochus. He set himself up as God. He called himself God. He fought against God. And uh, we see how that God describes him as being crafty and arrogant. Christian, don't you hope that you never would be said of you that you're an insolent, fierce-faced, fighting? And yet, what did God say to Israel? That you set your jaw, your stiff-necked people. We're capable. Believers are capable of being insolent, arrogant, defiant. And we have to say, oh God, please, please soften me more today. You know... Guys, some of you that work outside, our, our hands get like leather after a while. Um, what do you, eh, if you want to have a kind touch, what does those hands need? You got to put a little lotion or something on. You got to soft. And you know, I'm not that we want to be soft, these guys. I, I don't want to hurt you. Um, but we, we do have to remember we can be spiritually calloused. And we don't want that. And we say, God, please. Would you tenderize my heart to the things of you by, in all humility, that I would not ever defy you? Well, our third point I want us to consider is this. Our sovereign, our God is sovereign over three, judging the wicked. Over judging the wicked. Verse 25. Though his cunning, through, sorry, through his cunning, he shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule. And he shall exalt himself in his heart. He shall destroy many in their prosperity. He shall even rise against the prince of princes. And he shall be broken without human means. Here we come into this. Um, and through his shrewdness, by his cunning it says, he will cause deceit. That is, he... He's going to destroy a bunch of people uh, with ease. He's going to prosper. He's going to succeed. He's going to have influence at his hand. Um, he's going to magnify himself. And it all is going to happen without warning. Boy, isn't it amazing how fast things can move if things are just clicking for a political figure? All of a sudden, the tide can turn instantly. And here we see something like that happening uh, with this individual by his cunning uh, he's, he's shrewd, um, he's sharp, he's crafty in his own opinion, uh, in his own heart. Eh, that's, that's not the review that you want to get. He's going to come without warning. You know, uh, Tom mentioned, just uh, thankful that everything worked with our, that when the fire alarm system was down, that, you know, that there was security still, that God... God protect our building. And we're like, yeah, that is a good praise. You know, here, without warning means to be without security. Um, there was, um, and so basically men think themselves to be secure. They're safe from attack. And all of a sudden destruction comes upon them. Against the prince of princes, this fella is like. You see, in verse 11, Antiochus was seen as magnifying himself against the one called the prince of the host, who was identified as God. However, it's quite different. It fits the pattern of such titles as the Lord of Lords or King of Kings, who we'd see in Revelation. When regularly described to Christ, this suggests that the one mainly in mind here is Christ, which means that the principal one opposing him must be the Antichrist. In the pattern of Antiochus's disdain for God, then the Antichrist will seek to stand against Christ when Christ comes in glory to bring vengeance upon him, Revelation 19.19. 19. And it says that his, without hand he will be broken. Um, we see that 
without human hand, this king will be broken down. Um, in a sense, maybe regarding Antiochus, as um, we see that he actually dies in grief and remorse in Babylon historically, defeated in the siege of Elmaeus. Um, it does, uh, does make me wonder if this is just heavily picturing the Antichrist to come, but uh, that's a question I have. Uh, but it definitely, Antichrist is, or Antiochus, is a picture, I believe, of the Antichrist. And throughout this passage, you just see the flagrant rebellion that characterizes him. Um, our, our last uh, point here is this. Our God is sovereign over four, humbling us. He is able to humble us. And that's a good thing. Verse 15. Then it happened, then I, Daniel, had seen the vision and was seeking the meaning, and suddenly there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli, who called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell on my face. But he said to me, understand, son of man, that this, is, this vision refers or pertains to the time of the end. Now, let's see, I need to check verse 18. Now, as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep, or I sank into a deep sleep with my face to the ground. But he touched me and stood me upright. All right, so pause there. We see in these verses how that a godly man like Daniel is humbled before the Lord. And you know what? God can humble the righteous. He can humble the unrepentant. He can humble Antiochus. He's going to humble the Antichrist. Isn't that encouraging? God doesn't... God has the same effect upon all audiences in the appropriate time. But we see it very quickly coming from Daniel. How humble, how quickly are we humble before God? I would like to challenge you this week. How can you pursue being more humble with God? How can you pursue coming before God and saying, God, you know what, I just need to be opened up before you. One of the sad things in counseling is when I work with folks and then, um, I'll, I'll challenge him. Like, hey, could you uh, ask the Lord to forgive you? I don't have anything to ask for forgiveness for. I'm like, and my, and my gut just sinks. It just, oh, well, that was a fine hour that I just had with you. <laughs> just, it's just, and you just, and not about results, but it, the sadder thing, I'm like, this person does not see any soon. And I've been there before. I am not going to agree with you until I am convinced. And have you guys ever been guilty? At too much of the time, I find myself there. And we need to be ones that are a little quicker to humility. Well, look over in verse 27. As I have already said, Then I, Daniel, fainted and was sick for days. Afterward, I arose and went about the king's business, and I was astonished by the vision. But no one understood it. I think there's a level of weight that's appropriate for believers. What did Paul say was heavy upon him? And he said, I, I've been shipwrecked, left for dead, had all these things, but you know, what weighed on him the most? Do you remember? The weight of the churches, the prayer requests, the, the ministries, the, that weighed on him. Do you know what should be weighing on us? The things of God. If you're not burdened for the things of God, something's missing. And the key to humility is owning, having an ownership for the Lord. The Whackers, the only ones here, have been long enough. With, do you remember when Pastor Hoff, he was trying to train you guys so that the young, brand new, 20 some year old pastor that was here wouldn't be doing everything? And remember, he, he put this illustration up on a PowerPoint of someone throwing a, a pop can or a beer can out onto the church lawn, which is a weekly occurrence. And, uh, and he's like, hey, when you see a can on the church lawn, 
What did he say? Pick it up. Would you pick it up? I, he, he was, he, you know, I would like to encourage you, this is your church. Take some ownership of it. And we know that the church is not building our land, but we have the privilege of using this land for God. And, but when we take ownership and love the Lord's causes, we're like, Lord, how do, where do I get to chip in? Where do I get to wait, hold on to this? How do, God, can I have on me the weight of your prayer request, your saints, your ministries? Lord, weigh me down. I think there's an aspect with Daniel where you see he sees and he's weighted. The question is, are you seeing his ministries? Are you seeing your God? And is your heart weighted with the things that should be weighing the saints of God? Let's pray. Oh, I, not yet. I had one more thing. Uh, Ron Rhodes had something that was really good. Um, he shared... Ah, one of the things we struggled, the prosperity of the wicked, as I mentioned earlier. He shares this. Scripture reveals that the evil Antiochus will seem to prosper for a time. And we remember what the psalmist said. I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They are not in trouble as others are. They're not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace. And they set their mouths against the heavens. Psalm 73, verse 3 through 9. If this were the end of the story, then all would be vanity. But the truth is, the wicked fall hard in the end. The psalmist affirmed to God, you make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors, verse 18 and 19. Antiochus Epiphanes may have prospered for a time, but he fell hard and he fell permanently. I love how David says, no, it may not have been David. One of the psalms, psalmists said, and then I considered their end. When the world serves injustice, don't despair because of the moment. The story is not finished. Let's pray. Lord God, would you help us to be humble before you? Help us to have a very wide angle lens that looks at the panorama of your hand and we say, by faith, God, you've got this. You always have. You always will. And Lord, would you please help us to come before you and remember the end of the wicked. Help us to remember the prosperity of the wicked. It's not the end of the story. Lord, help us to consider their end. Help us to remember your common grace in this age that you send rain on the just and the unjust. Help us, Father, to be ones that look at life and are weighted with the right things. Help us, Lord, not to despair with the things that the world might crush us with, but help us to have a holy yearning for your righteousness, Lord. Help us to be grieved by the right things. Help us to be in love with your causes. Lord, weight us down with your request. We love you, Lord. And then, Lord, I say weight us down. I also know that we cast all of our cares on you. By waiting... I mean, help us to have ownership and a full heart and mind like Paul did. We commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen.